Hello, my name is uh, Niegoś Dube. I live in Warsaw, Poland. Um, I am a member of the Polish uh, Humanist Association, and I am also an Esperantist and a member of the Atheist Worldwide Esperanto Organization. Um, in fact, I am the uh, editor of that organization's bulletin called Ateismo. Um, I have been invited by Andrzej Dominiczak, president of the Polish Humanist Association, to speak about um, a unique uh, Polish Jewish figure of the 19th century and the early 20th century, Ludwig uh, Zamenhof, um, who is best known as the inventor of Esperanto, the language of this bulletin. Um, Esperanto was uh, developed as an uh, international language. Um, many people do know, have heard about Esperanto, but probably few people know about Zamenhof, the inventor of Esperanto. Um, he is, of course, uh, he was born in Poland, and so he's quite well known, I think, in, in Poland itself. There are streets in many cities named for Zamenhof, including here in, in Warsaw. Um, let me start with the end of Zamenhof's life, because uh, this year is uh, the 100th anniversary of Zamenhof's death. Um, in April 19, uh, 1917, and he uh, died at a relatively young age uh, of 57. Um, this year, on the exact anniversary of his death, on April 14th, the Polish parliament, the same, um, paid homage uh, to Zamenhof. Um, they had a moment of silence, and also they adopted a resolution by unanimous acclamation, honoring uh, Zamenhof. So he is uh, generally considered in Poland uh, as an important uh, uh, part of uh, Polish uh, history and an important uh, uh, Polish personality. Um, I would like to first uh, give a brief um, overview of his life and then um, talk about his, um, his ideas and contributions. Um, he was born in 1859 in Białystok, Poland, uh, which is in the northeast part of the country. Um, at that time, it was part of the Russian Empire, as was Warsaw and most of uh, Poland. Uh, Białystok was a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-lingual um, city. There were Russians, Germans, Poles, Jews, and uh, some other nationalities living in the, in the city. Um, when uh, Zamenhof was growing up, he witnessed a lot of conflict between these groups. Um, there were clashes in the streets, um, there were often tensions, bad relations between them, and this had a big uh, impact on him and um, eventually led him to develop uh, Esperanto. I'll talk about that in, in just a couple of minutes. He lived in Białystok until he was 14 when his parents moved to Warsaw, uh, where I am right now. And this was in 1873. Uh, when he came to Warsaw, he continued his uh, studies in high school or gymnasium, as it's called in Poland. And in about 1875, uh, when he was around uh, 16 years old, he began working on his own language. He, he got the idea that one way to help solve conflicts between ethnic groups of the type that he observed in Bialystok was for them to have a common neutral language. And so this became his mission at the time. And he began uh, working on this la language. And this, in, in this effort, he was helped by his own knowledge of languages. Um, he spoke Russian, uh, Polish, uh, German, Yiddish, and also studied uh, French, Latin, and Greek in school. Also, he knew some Hebrew from um, attending synagogue with his, uh, mainly with his uh, mother, and there was Hebrew was taught also in the context of, uh, of, the, synagogue, of the synagogue that he attended. So he had a rather wide knowledge of languages, and he used this knowledge uh, to develop this, uh, to develop uh, his international neutral language, and also he um, started studying English in high school. And uh, once he started studying English, he realized that grammar of languages can be much simpler because the other languages that he knew had very complicated uh, declensions and conjugations, and English is much simpler. So this this um, also had a major impact on on him. Um, well, in 1878, when he was 19 years old, after uh, working on the language for a couple of years, he developed an initial version of the language, 
and celebrated it by having a gathering of his uh, school friends. And in fact, several of his school friends learned the language and promised to help him spread the language. So they had a sort of a party to launch, uh, to launch the language. Um, but next year, uh, it was now 1879, um, it was time to go to university. Um, he went to study in Moscow, the capital of the Russian Empire. And his father, uh, who was not very enthusiastic about his pursuits with this, uh, with this international language, ordered him basically to stop working on it while he was uh, studying medicine um, at the university. And so he kept this promise. He studied in Moscow for a couple of years. The problem was that there was a growing atmosphere of anti-Semitism. Uh, Zamenhof was uh, Jewish. And uh, so uh, a couple of years later, in 1881, he returned to Warsaw and continued studies, his medical studies at the University of Warsaw. And he also uh, resumed work on his language. Um, his father took all his papers when he left for Moscow, promised to keep them safely, but actually he burned all his papers. And so he had to start from scratch. He, he remembered a lot of uh, his language, but he basically um, began uh, working on a, a new language uh, and uh, probably it was a better version of the first one. Um, in 1885, he got his medical degree and then he started his medical practice. And he chose to start his practice in a small village in Lithuania called Viesiai, which is a, quite a well-known resort town in Lithuania. And um, he, worked, uh, he worked there for about a year and in his spare time, he intensively worked on developing his, uh, the new version of his international language. Um, he came back to Warsaw one year later in 1886 and decided to specialize in ophthalmology in, um, uh, and became an eye doctor or oculist. And this is, this is the specialty that he uh, practiced for the rest of his life. Um, the following year in 1887, he um, met his future wife, they got engaged. And with the money that he got as a dowry from her father, who was a fairly wealthy man, he owned a factory. With this dowry, he um, published the first book introducing Esperanto to the world. Um, it was not called Esperanto yet, I will just uh, explain that. It was called Lingvo Internacia, uh, International Language. And he published this book under the pseudonym Doctoro Esperanto, which means Esperanto means a person who hopes. Esperi is the verb for um, uh, hope. So he did not use his name Zamenhof, he used the name Doctoro Esperanto. But soon enough, the language became known as the uh, language of Esperanto, Espera, and the language itself became Esperanto simply. And that's the, that's the story of uh, the name of, of the language. Um, in the meantime, he um, again, he moved about. He was living in Warsaw. Then he moved to Grodno, which is now in Belarus, and was there for uh, several years practicing, um, uh, practicing ophthalmology. And then came back to Warsaw in 1898 and uh, lived there for the rest of his life until he died in 1917. So he lived in Warsaw after that for nearly 20 years. In that time, uh, besides uh, uh, practicing uh, ophthalmology, he, of course, he worked to spread Esperanto. He, he did a lot of translating um, into Esperanto, for example, the whole uh, Bible, the Old and New Testament, um, a couple of Shakespeare plays, including Hamlet, a lot of poetry, and he himself wrote some original poetry in Esperanto. So, and then he um, was busy with developing the movement and he attended um, the uh, World Esperanto Congresses. The first one was in 1905 and he attended all the subsequent ones until 1913. Um, when the First World War broke out, uh, the Congresses were suspended. And uh, so uh, the last Congress that he attended was in 1913. Now, uh, Getting back to his ideas and contributions. Now, I've already mentioned, obviously, that he um, created the language uh, known as Esperanto. But his idea was, not, of course, not simply to develop a practical tool to help people communicate. Uh, because of what he had uh, witnessed in Białystok, um, he developed this idealism of world peace and brotherhood. And he wanted to see, uh, for him, as uh, the international language was a tool to, um, to promote uh, brotherhood between peoples around the world. So this, this was his overall vision. 
and uh, this was this was part of his his wider vision and the language was uh, the language was a tool in this vision and in fact he um, encouraged the esperanto movement to follow something called the interna ideo which means the internal idea that the idea being that um, esperanto is more than just a tool of communication it is uh, it is an instrument, for just what I've just said, an instrument for peace, brotherhood, for, for justice, and for equality of, of peoples on the basis of a common uh, neutral language. And uh, this idea is still quite strong in the Esperanto movement, and it's, uh, it's something that attracts a lot of people to Esperanto. There are people who are attracted to Esperanto because they see it as an easy language, easy to learn, and uh, it helps in traveling and uh, communicating with people from different countries. Um, that's one side of it, but there is also the idealistic side, which, uh, which he himself uh, encouraged and which was very important to him. But um, less, less known about Zamenhof is that um, he didn't only seek to promote uh, a universal language, he um, was also interested in developing a universal religion. Um, he was, um, as I said, he was, he was Jewish. He was rather a secular Jew. He was not an you know, a Orthodox Jew. He was not very religious. But he still, um, he still had a, a, a sort of general uh, belief in a supreme being, um, but not necessarily the Old Testament type of, uh, type of God. And um, observing the conflicts between different religious groups, um, he also thought that it would be important to have some sort of a... a a uh, universal bridge religion, a sort of, um, if you will, an Esperanto of religions. And now Esperanto as a language, uh, his vision of Esperanto was as a second common language for everybody, not, not as a replacement for existing languages, just a common language that would um, everyone could, could, could speak uh, while having their own languages. And, and with religion, he sort of had a similar idea, in fact, and um, he thought that people could, uh, while continuing to belong to their particular religious traditions, whether it be Catholic, uh, Protestant, uh, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, whatever, that they could also uh, belong to this universal religion, which he called homaranismo, which is an Esperanto word uh, coming from the root homo, which means uh, human being or person, like homo sapiens in English. And homaro means uh, humanity. Homarano means a member of humanity, being a member of this group. So um, a translation into English could be humanityism, you might say, but uh, we can just call it uh, humanism in the form because it is a form of humanism. So it was a sort of humanistic, a humanistic religion, a religion to bridge, bridge existing traditional religions, but in a humanistic way. And uh, the religion, uh, his, his idea was very simple. It was based on the well-known golden rule. Uh, do unto others what you would like to them to do unto you. Do not do unto others what you would not want them to do unto you. Very old and good principle. And also he believed that people should, uh, as much as possible, follow their own conscience. And um, uh, so, he, um, so he had this idea, but the, the, the idea was... Um, People said, "Well, it's a very nice idea, but he didn't. Uh, it, it didn't go very far in terms of uh, developing into a movement as as Esperanto did. Esperanto, in the meantime, uh, was fairly successful, spread around the world. There are Esperanto associations all over the world um, today, and the congresses continue um, internationally and nationally. And um, but with the religion, it, it remained mostly a, a good idea. Um, but." Uh, I just thought it's important to mention that he had this this vision alongside the, the vision of the language because he had this broader idea of universal brotherhood and he wanted to spread it via language and and religion and a universal religion. And also, I would like to mention in connection with the uh, with his uh, religious ideas is that he believed that people should be um, able to freely leave their religions uh, because in some countries it, it could be it can be a, a problem. Even in Poland, Catholics have to formally go through a process to formally leave the Catholic Church if they were baptized into it. So he, um, he believed that people should be free to leave their religion, to free to publicly re renounce it, and to declare themselves liber creda, which is very similar to, which means free believing, um, which is very similar to uh, free thinking, uh, liber pensa in Esperanto. And he, uh, he felt that people should be able to 
to join a Liber Creda community, and this community should be officially recognized by the state um, alongside, um, alongside religions. Um, so he had this very um, humanistic uh, concept um, of religion. And finally, I would just like to conclude by stating one more political idea that he had, um, that he promoted during the First World War. In 1915, in the middle of the First World War, um, during the uh, terrible slaughter, which really pained him very much because he was a man of peace, um, he wrote something called the Appeal to Diplomats, uh, al voco al diplomatoi, and he believed that after the war there should be strong attention paid to uh, to the idea that states should not be linked with ethnicity, that the st uh, states should be separated from ethnicity and that every state should belong to all the people who live in that state, regardless of whether they are a majority or minority in that state. And uh, so this was, um, uh, this was um, a vision that he tried to promote also. And he also believed that eventually there, there should be a united Europe, uh, a United States of Europe uh, idea. So, but um, these were... Um, uh, this, these were ideas that came out during a time of war and um, um, uh, unfortunately none, I, those ideas have not, have not gone much further than that. Um, thank you very much.